Good morning, greetings. Dumelang, Liamo Ketse, Momochai, Siana Mogela, Rooted Fellowship. Welcome, Bayons Kak. Welcome to church. Uh, I greet you all in the living name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, my name is Jono, if we haven't met, and I get the privilege of serving here as, as one of the pastors under our lead pastor, Pastor Oni uh, And uh, what a joy it is to be able to be in God's Word today, to gather as God's people this morning. I feel encouraged just up till now. So, I mean, this is fantastic. Like, we've had worship, we've been led, confidence has led us so well through what's happening in the life of this church. We've engaged with one another. Man, isn't it amazing to be part of a living, breathing church like this? Amen? Yeah. So uh, this morning, we come to the end of the first part of our Psalms mixtape series. Uh, I guess for those of us who can remember the days of mixtapes, you could say that we're coming to the end of side A, uh, and after which we're going to eject the tape, flip the switch, take it out, uh, turn around in the tape deck and put it back in uh, and carry on with this epic mix. For those of you born after the mid-90s, you don't know what I'm saying. Uh, you have many questions. I'm just going to keep it moving. Okay. <laughs> Uh, if you have been enjoying our uh, Psalms mixtape series, one of the, it's one of those good news, sad news situations. The sad news is that, unfortunately, uh, we'll be taking a break uh, for a little while. But the good news is that we'll be back with our Psalms mixtape series, Side B, a little bit later in the year uh, as part of our 2024 year of worship. So that's coming up. More good news, though. Next up on the church's playlist will be a series titled Family Matters. Pastor Oni mentioned this last week, uh, and so for the next three weeks following this week, we're going to be discussing what biblical family matters look like. What does the Bible say about marriage? What does the Bible say about parenting? What does the Bible say about singleness? And much like we did in our church and empire series, we're gonna be looking at what God says about these matters, and then, as Pastor Oni mentioned last week, we're going to follow up these times with a time where we hear from a range of different voices that speak to these specific topics. That's what's coming up. And so no doubt, there's undoubt, no doubt in my mind that you do not want to miss any of these weeks, right? So as always, invite your friends, invite your families, invite your one mores. Uh, we're going to kick off the Family Matters series next week by looking at... Singleness, yes. And we want to make this time as engaging. There you go, I was waiting for that. So I'm trying to, yeah. We want to make this time as engaging as, uh, as possible. And so if you have any questions pertaining to singleness that you would like answered by the panel during those times, uh, you can engage with us uh, in a number of ways. Um, and this is going to be the case for each of the three weeks, okay? So you can engage with us like this for the next three weeks. You can either write out your question on a piece of paper and pop it in the, the jar at the Sabona table. Um, you can choose to write your name on it, or it can be anonymous. You can engage with us on Instagram on the Wednesday before. So on Wednesday coming up, with, so that's on election, uh, election day, Wednesday the 29th of May for Sunday the 2nd of June on singleness. You can engage with us there on Instagram. Of course, it won't be anonymous then, right? Unless your Instagram handle is something like anonymousj28. Yeah. <laughs> then we're not going to know who you are. But if it's like, hey, John Otato, well, then we're going to know who you are. Uh, alternatively, you can send your questions through your family group leaders. Some of you have done that, and man, I'm saying I've seen some of the questions. They're looking really, really good already. So we need those questions by today. If you're writing them out or if you're sending them to your family group leader, please, by today. Otherwise, you can engage with us online on Wednesday on Instagram. Cool. Clear? Happy? Great, that's where, we've been, uh, that's where we've been, that's where we are going. Uh, but before that, we still have one awesome, power, epic fire track that we need to savor and enjoy this morning. And it's a goodie. Uh, it's a classic. It's certainly one of the most well-known psalms. It's the, its first few verses have adorned many a cup, many a keyring, many a mug, uh, and Christian um, regalia. And it's been a great source of encouragement to believers throughout the ages. Of course, if you've got your devotionals and been going through those with us, you would know that we are talking about Psalm, let's try it again, 27. You see how we're intentional? Well, we're saying 24 hours in a day, but you have three hours extra, gives you? <laughs> Mathematicians gives you 27. Ah, okay. 27, Psalm 27. And yet again, the, the author of this Psalm is King David, as most of the Psalms from book one or the first 41 Psalms were written by King David. 
But before I push play on the last track of side A, track eight, Psalm 27, let me hit pause and remind us of two sayings from some well-known theologians who said the following about the Psalms. Gordon Wenham said that the Psalms require involvement from the reader and that such involvement or recitation alters a person's relationship with God in a way that mere listening does not. We need to be involved. Tim Keller said that the Psalms were not written merely to be read, but they are to be prayed, recited, and sung, to be practiced, to be done. And so, much like we did with track four, uh, Psalm 16, this morning I'm gonna once again invite you to stand with me as we recite together track eight, Psalm 27, from the beautiful Word of God. We're all gonna read, yeah, please stand. We're all gonna read from the screen in front of us from Psalm 27, and we're gonna be reading together from the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB. We're gonna read it aloud slowly. I'll set the pace, follow along with me. Uh, And as we do this, I invite you to truly pray these words. Come Holy Spirit, lead us, move within our hearts and minds as we say these words. Lord, indeed, your words together. Let's say it together. Psalm 27, my stronghold of David. Verse one. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? When evildoers come against me to devour my flesh, my foes and my enemies stumbled and fell. Though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid. Though a war breaks out against me, I will still be confident. I have asked one thing from the Lord. It is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking him in his temple. For he will conceal me in his shelter in the day of adversity. He will hide me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Then my head will be high above my enemies around me. I will offer sacrifices in his tent with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Lord, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious to me and answer me. My heart says this about you. Seek his face. Lord, I will seek your face. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not leave me or abandon me. God of my salvation. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord cares for me. Because of my adversaries, show me your way, Lord, and lead me on a level path. Do not give me over to the will of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing violence. I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, you are our source of all life. And Jesus, you have saved us. And so in you, we find our true, indeed, our only real confidence and resolute safety and security. Lord, Lord, no matter what we face, no matter who seeks to destroy us, we know that if you are for us, it doesn't matter who or what or what circumstances are against us because we have you, we have life, we have joy, we have goodness, peace, love, security, and shelter. In you, Lord, we have eternal assurance, assurance of your beautiful, wonderful, powerful presence, assurance of your comfort. And so, Lord, as we come here today, We long to see your face. We're waiting on you, Lord. We long to experience your life-giving beauty, to enjoy your presence, not merely as a means to an end, Lord, but to enjoy you for you, because we love you, Lord. We are your children. 
You are our devoted Heavenly Father who loves us unconditionally. And so Holy Spirit, come and lead us now in this time to enjoy hearing from your word, to appreciate the beauty of your word and your truth, Lord God. Lord Jesus, would all of our deeds, our thoughts, our actions now in this time bring you such great joy and delight as we delight in you. Remind us, Lord God, that in you, we have everything we need. Would you bring comfort to those of us in deep need of your comfort now, Lord God? And Lord, would you move those of us who have become cold and distant to you and what you have called us to? We ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. We wait on you, Holy Spirit. Come and move. Make us strong for what you have called us to. May we take heart. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 I invite you to have a seat. Okay, but before we dive deeply into the, the lyrics of our track for today, per, permit me to remind you of some of the discography uh, surrounding this album that we're going through. The book of Psalms is a collection, remember, of 150 ancient Hebrew poems, songs, and prayers. 150 ancient Hebrew poems, songs, and prayers. And they were taken from the various periods of the nation of Israel's history. Most of these psalms were used by the choirs that sang in Israel's temple, or they were prayed as liturgies by families at home. But the book of Psalms is not merely a hymn book or a prayer book or a prayer liturgy. After the nation of Israel's exile to Babylon, these psalms were carefully, prayerfully, and intentionally put together and arranged into the book of Psalms that we have before us today in our Bibles. In essence, the book of Psalms is a virtual temple that we enter into in order to meet with God and to listen to the story of God's kingdom sung back to us with poetry. The book of Psalms is a virtual temple that we enter into in order to meet with God and to listen to the story of God and His kingdom sung back to us within poetry. The first section of the book is made up of the first 41 Psalms, and as we've mentioned this previously, uh, the bulk of Psalms found uh, in book one, including today's Psalm 27, were authored by David. And so it's safe to say that David's story is extremely significant for us as we look at these Psalms. David experienced many times of hardship and waiting. But through it all, he waits on the Lord and places his unwavering confidence in who God is and in what God has done. And in our Psalm 27 today, we have David writing a song about the beauty of God's presence and how it leads him to have unwavering confidence in God. The beauty of God's presence and how it leads him to have unwavering confidence in God. Now, as I, as I said earlier and as I made mention of a few weeks ago, these words were penned to be delighted in and recited aloud. And so as we dive deeper into the psalm, I want to again say at the outset that if you feel uh, led to join me in reading these words of these 14 verses as I go through them, if you want to read them out aloud, uh, amen them, please feel free and be encouraged to do so. But more though about Psalm 27 specifically, there's some debate uh, surrounding the circumstances of the psalm. Uh, it was, however, undoubtedly recorded by David during an extremely difficult time in his life. Some scholars say that Psalm 27 was written when David was fleeing uh, from King Saul because of Saul's extreme jealousy as he knew that David would succeed him as the new king of Israel. And if that was the case, would you just, would you just think about the injustice for a moment? David is this long-time loyal servant of Saul, um, but Saul is so utterly jealous of David that he sets out to take his, take his own life, take his life. And other scholars say that Psalm 27 was written uh, by David when he was fleeing from his son Absalom, who had con conspired to take his father's throne. Because remember, in a monarchy such as this, uh, the way that you take the king's throne is by killing the king. And so it's a horrible situation of family betrayal. So whatever the circumstances were, injustice, betrayal, this is an extremely difficult time in David's life. David is clearly facing some serious adversity. His real life physical enemies are pursuing him. They're out to kill him. But what was his response? What is his response? 
And that's where we, we come to our text this morning. Verse 1, what does David respond in this circumstance? David responds by confidently preaching to himself. He preaches to himself. He says this. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? Paul Tripp, uh, when teaching on these verses, says that David doesn't just open the psalm with statements about who God is to all of humanity or who God is generally. David doesn't just recite abstract truths about God or theoretical truths about God or sound biblical arguments. He doesn't say, the Lord is light and salvation. That's true. He doesn't say, the Lord is a stronghold. That is true. It's correct theology. David doesn't just attempt to define God, but he redefines who David is as a child of God. He doesn't seek to just attempt to define God. He redefines who he is as a child of God. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? Christians have said for years that Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Whilst that is true, that often causes the analytical thinkers to be a bit skeptical. They feel like it's just a bit warm and fuzzy. It's so subjective, devoid of objective truth. That's not true at all, actually. But perhaps a better way of putting it is like this. Theology, the study of who God is and and what He has done, must become personal. It must transcend the brain and go to the heart. It must cause a person to redefine who they are as a child of God and thus the way that they live their life. Here we have a confident David, not because of his knowledge of the law, which he knew well, not because uh, he knew the the word of God that that leads to his confidence. He's not confident because of his intellectual abilities that, that lead him to understand God's law and God's word well. No, that's not why he's confident. He's confident in the midst of his struggles because he knows who he is as a child of the most high, all powerful, all knowing, ever present God. David knows God's presence in his life. He's not just focused on the truths about God. If we look at John 9, the Pharisees, they, they, question, they, 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 they question extremely difficultly the, the, the blind man in John 9. And they say to him, how, do, how is it that you see? How is it that you see? They're so focused on the law and they perceive Jesus as the lawbreaker who healed this man on the Sabbath. And so they'd say, tell us, how did he do this? How did he do this? And he says, how he did it, I don't know. All I know is I once was blind, but now I see. I once was blind, but now I see. I don't know how he did it. Family, do you know so much about God, but it hasn't transcended your brain and gone to your heart yet? I've shared the story once before, but, but we're on a mission trip a couple of years ago and uh, one of the, the leaders shared the story. He said he was out one night ministering to people, and a person came across his way, and he said to him, why are you guys here? Like, why, what are you doing here? What are you evangelizing? And he tried to argue this person into faith. And at the end of that conversation, he said to him, I don't want what you're offering. Thanks very much. I'm going because of the way that you're engaging with me. I don't want these truths that you're just giving to me. He was, so, he was so affected by this, this leader of ours. He was so affected by this, but that night he went and he just said, Lord, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. Um, I, just please forgive me for, for that way in which I've legalistically tried to argue this person into believing in you. Next night he went back and he said, as a God's grace to him, this man came by. And he said to him, yeah, I'm not here to argue with you. I'm not even here to actually share facts with you. I'm just, I want to tell you something. I'm sorry. And he said to him, something's different about you. I can see love in your eyes. Let's have a conversation about your God. Do we know so much about God or do we know who we are in light of who God is? Family, theology is great. It's important. But it must be theology that redefines us as children of God. Amen? David's childlike knowledge of God's protecting presence gives him confidence and banishes his fear. And it is the living out of this redefining theology that leads David to be able to say, 
When evildoers, verse 2, when evildoers come against me to devour my flesh, my foes and my enemies stumbled and fell. Though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid, verse 3. Though a war breaks out against me, I will still be confident. Now, now we've seen this a few times in our psalm series. In these arduous moments in David's life, he once again doesn't begin by complaining. If I was being pursued by people who were seeking to murder me, I'm not sure I'd have the same response. But we see that David yet again begins by reminding himself of the truth of the word of God. In God, David has salvation. He has eternal life secured. He has a relationship with his heavenly father, creator God, the giver and sustainer of all life, sovereign and good, holy one in control of everything. And so whom shall he fear? Family, it's never more important to remind yourself, dare I say it's never more important to preach to yourself the truth of God's word than in moments in life when life as you know it seems to be falling apart or just doesn't make sense. Pastor Arne said this last week when we went through Psalm 42. We can't be leaning into God and leaning into community when things are just going great. And I'm guilty of that. Man, when things are going well, my devotional life, next level. But when things are going really, really tough, am I preaching God's truths and of who He is and who I am in light of who He is in those difficult times? I was deeply encouraged this week as I uh, uh, went to family group um, we, have a, we have a motto. I've, I've just kind of joined this family group, my, my family and, my, and ourselves. We've joined this family group and, and, and I've picked up on a, on, a, on a family group saying of ours. It says, uh, it, it's not a competition, but if it was a family group competition, we'd be winning. <laughs> Mamaruti, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think, please let that be the motto of every family group, right? After gospel-centered disciple-making transcultural, of course. Every family group should believe that they have the best family group. But I was, so, I was so encouraged because the folks who were hosting us this week, it had been a difficult week. Their daughter was sick. Man, it would have been so easy to be like, let's, let's, let's not meet this week. But we went, and we were encouraged as a community by them opening up their homes, opening up their lives, and opening up their difficulties so we could pray for them and be there. No matter what adversity we are facing, and some of you are going through the most, but family, we need to hear this encouragement. These enemies that you are facing or the adversities of your life, they pale into insignificance when we look at the never-ending greatness of God. And that leads our hearts to be strengthened by the Lord. And so in light of that, David says that he has prayed a deep and beautiful prayer, verse four. He says, I have asked one thing from the Lord. It is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking Him in His temple. Now, some scholars have, have debated what David was referring to when he speaks of the house of the Lord and the temple. Some say he was talking about the tabernacle, Israel's place of worship in Gibeon, and others say that he was referring to the temple that his son Solomon would go on to build, uh, because that temple was so often on his mind. I agree with others, though, who believe that actually when David writes this, he is more concerned with the presence of the Lord, because in the Old Testament, the people of God would encounter the presence of God in the tabernacle and in the temple. Family, David's confidence in the Lord comes from the fact that he found true fulfillment in the brilliant, excellent, beautiful, attractive, and alluring presence of the Lord. Notice how he uses the word gaze. To gaze is not catching a one-time cursory glimpse. Instead, it is a steady and sustained focus. It's not entering into a prayer or a conversation with, a, with God with a quick petitionary prayer, making a quick request before God. Lord, please help me ace this test in Jesus' name, amen. Now, that's not a bad thing, okay? It's not a bad thing. We, we can do that. But that's not what David is talking about here. That doesn't lead, those prayers don't lead to an unwavering confidence in God. David here is speaking of a yearning or a longing to praise, admire, and enjoy God. Not for what he can do 
but for who he is. To enjoy God, not just for the fact that he saved him, but for the fact of who God is. To enjoy something or to appreciate something just for what it is. It takes true beauty to do that. True beauty. Only truly beautiful things captivate us and cause us to enjoy them for what they are not as an end of themselves. Look at the arts, look at nature. Think of the things that bring you joy. The art or the music lover may have started studying film or music or carpentry in order to learn how to perform or to create, but at some point, they begin to enjoy their craft just for the satisfaction it brings. They play to play. Some of you shared in your, your answers to question of the day about some of the things that you need to do. And some of those things, I'm sure, would have brought you uh, a result, something at the end of those things. But I have no doubt that some of those things were things that you just enjoyed doing for them, for the sake of doing them. Confidence, I wonder, if, is it, is it the, joy, the shopping and getting stuff, or is it actually just the act of shopping in and of itself? <laughs> it's both. Okay, that's fine. That's okay. Think of getting away in creation. When we are strung out and stressed and in need of a break, where do we seek to get away to? We long for beautiful places. We long to look at oceans and rivers, at mountains and valleys, and to be in beautiful landscapes because true beauty and excellence is attractive and it brings restful contentment. We don't gaze at nature for any other reason other than to enjoy it. When I feel down and stressed, I like to put on uh, nature doc documentaries. And it reminds me of how small I am and how beautiful God's creation is. And it captivates me. And I'm, I, it's as if I spend time in God's presence just recognizing and acknowledging his beautiful creation. And David finds God truly beautiful. He doesn't see God as his performative personal vending machine. Put a prayer in, get an answer out. David's desire is to sense God's beauty in and all around him, within his heart, to take such pleasure in God that it leads David to rest content. Family, to perceive God as he really is, is pleasurable and beautiful. And hear me, if we haven't found God to be beautiful, excellent, and alluring, then we don't truly know God. Our God is infinite, immense, and good. He is just, merciful, gracious, and kind. He is all-powerful, ever-present, and all-knowing. He is holy, completely, and utterly set apart. He is perfect. He always existed. He is transcendent and eternal. He never changes. He is wise, sovereign, truthful, faithful, loving, and that's just to name but a few. Our God is the good and perfect Father. He is the beginning and the end. He is the true anointed one. He is the word. He is our rock and our salvation. He is our righteousness and he is peace. He is our shepherd and our healer. He sanctifies and provides for us. He is mighty. He is creator. He is the most high and he is alive. And that's just to name but a few. It seems so simple, but the basic truth is this. There is only one thing we need in this life to know and experience the beauty and love of our triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That is what brought David ultimate contentment as his enemies are pursuing him. And it's what brings Christians ultimate contentment as well. Brother and sister, do you find the things of God so beautiful that the things of this world pale into insignificance? Do you find such joy and pleasure in the things of God? Do you delight in his word, in the gathering of his people, in praying and communing? Do you absolutely just love dwelling and abiding with him as you sing his praises here and draw your attention to who he is, his attributes, to his names, to everything he's done for you? What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Do you delight in gathering with his people and singing his praises? Because you see, family, we're all worshiping something. 
Spend time with anyone, Pastor Onia said this many times, spend time with anyone, get them talking. It doesn't take very long to reveal what we find beautiful and take pleasure in and delight in. Family, do you get excited by gathering and worshiping and meditating on God's thoughts? On the thoughts of God, the things of God? Or do you kind of show up critical? Man, I hope they play my favorite track today. Oh man, that wasn't good, eh? <sighs> nah, that wasn't good. Are you showing up expectant to just enjoy God? On a Sunday, a family group, in the mornings, as you open up God's word, Lord, speak to me. Actually, no, delight in God. And he, as he does, you do that, he will no doubtedly speak to you. David is excited just by worshiping him, meditating on thoughts about him. And it brings him so much pleasure and peace that he's able to say in the day of adversity, verse 5 and 6, he's, he's able to say that God will conceal me in his shelter. He will hide me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Then my head will be high above my enemies around me. Paul Tripp again says, when talking about these verses, he says, David understands that there's one who sits on a throne of the universe who is way more beautiful than any ugly thing you will face in your life. And you will only properly perceive the ugly things in your life when you look at them through the awesome glory of the beauty of your Redeemer. There was a song way back when, uh, if I haven't given you away my age with the, the mixtape, I've given it away now. A song way back when that said, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. David correctly sees his situation in light of the beauty of God, and this leads him to declare that no matter what, God will protect him. God will protect him from his enemies and his circumstances, and so he can rest secure. David knows God personally, and this leads him to have confidence in who God is and who David is as a child of God. And because of this, David has a deep appreciation for his loving father, and he appreciates God's beauty and longs for it more and more. And he recognizes that the only, only the beauty of God will sustain him as he faces life's trials. Which again, as he recognizes those things, that in turn causes him to long and to know God even more. And, if, and this brings him even more confidence in God. Family, do you see? It's a perpetual cycle. Knowing God, knowing him personally, leads us to have confidence in who we are in light of God. This causes us to love, enjoy, and appreciate the beauty of God. I know God because Jesus made a way for me to know him and to become part of his family forever. Amen? I know that I'm his child, which leads me to have confidence in the fact that he knows me, and he cares for me, and he loves me. Which leads me to have even more confidence in God, no matter what the situation I face is. And this leads me to an ever-increased desire for his presence and intimacy. Round and round and round and round we go. And all of this leads to an even more authentic relationship with God. It leads us to share the depths of our hearts with Him. We begin to feel secure enough in God to cry out to Him and to share our deepest fears and desires of our hearts. That's what David does. See with me, our next stanza from Psalm 27, from verses 7 to 9. David says this. He says, Lord, hear my voice. He cries out, Lord, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious to me and answer me. My heart says this about you. Seek His face. Lord, I will seek your face. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not leave me nor abandon me. God of my salvation. God of my salvation. Here in these verses, it's as if the mood changes a little bit. David makes repeated requests, pleading with God, his Savior and his helper. He cries out to, to God to hear him and to not withdraw God's presence from him. Once again, this shows us the intensity of David's need for God. And that, once again, it is God's face, His presence that David seeks above all else. But what's incredible is this. Look at what these petitions, look at what David's petitions lead him to say in verse 10. Don't, don't withdraw your presence from me, Lord God. And then he says this in verse 10. He says, even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord cares for me. 
Through his desperate cries for God's consistent presence, David develops an even deeper sense of dependence on God. David realizes that if our heart's delight is in God and in his face or his presence, then followers of God can face earthly suffering without fear. David recognizes that if his greatest treasure, communion with the living heavenly father, is safe and secure, then there really is nothing to be afraid of. Even the forsaking by blood families. Many Christian brothers and sisters have had to endure this tragic experience of being forsaken by their earthly family for various reasons. Could be because of broken homes, differences in beliefs, even abuse. And even years after the fact, this pain can linger on. Family, if that's you, you need to hear David's words. God's truth this morning. In God, you have the perfect heavenly Father who can heal your hurts and fill that void in your life. His love is sufficient. And through faith and trust in Him, you are adopted into the blood-bought family of God. David says, with God, we need not even fear family abandonment. And yet, family, if we're honest... There are actually so many things that we are afraid of. And many of them, like the abandoning of family, they're legit. They're rational. They're reasonable. They're understandable, given all that we've gone through and all that we face and continue to face. We're concerned about job security. We're worried about our kids, our health, the future, upcoming elections. Will we get the things we want to get? Will we achieve the things we want to achieve? our relationships, family circumstances. This past week while I was prepping, I read uh, one theologian say that that our fears, they serve an important purpose. They reveal to us where we have really located our heart's treasures. And if you follow the pathway of your fear and track it back in your heart, you will discover the things that you love more than God. Lord, help us reorient the treasures of our hearts. Would you take your rightful place in our hearts so that we would desire communion with you above all else? And as we do that, our earthly concerns fade into the background in light of your presence. God sees your struggles. They're not insignificant, but they pale in comparison to knowing the living Savior. Amen? Amen? We then come to verses 11 and 12. David says this. Verse 11 says, because of my adversaries, show me your way, Lord. Lead me on a level path. Do not give me over to the will of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing violence. See this. After having prayed for perpetual fellowship with God, after having prayed those things, David then and only then does he ask God for protection from his foes. And here, when David speaks of of the level or the straight path, he is praying that all obstacles that he faces would be removed. That's what he's praying. All obstacles, remove them, Lord God. Family, now, honestly, if this were me, at best, this would be where I start my prayer. Lord God, remove these obstacles from my life. Remove my enemies. (laughs) Crush my enemies. Protect me. And in all likelihood, I mean, I'd want to say that, I, that I'd go to them because you are good and because you are sovereign, but I'd probably stop there. I wouldn't consider praying for a deeper presence, pre- sense of God's presence in my life, for a greater thirst for his communion. And that's probably why I miss out on the confidence that David has in God. Because of the value that David has placed on his intimacy with God, David has unreservedly boldness in the face of persecution. He is bold in the face of persecution. We see this unwavering confidence once again as we come to our final two verses, 13 and 14. David says that, he says this. David says that he is certain. He is certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. Family, the psalm concludes on a triumphant note. In spite of being pursued to be killed, 
David is resolute in his belief that God will come to the rescue of his people. He is assured in his belief that he will experience the goodness of God through fellowship, relationship, guidance, and yes, even protection from death. But it's first to the goodness of God, the fellowship with God, the relationship with God, guidance, and then the protection. Verse 14's words are of encouragement. They're reminiscent of some other words. I don't know if you recognize that. They're reminiscent of Moses' words to Joshua in Deuteronomy 31 verse 7. Also of God's words to Joshua throughout chapter 1 of Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. What's significant about this is that if we look at the history of the nation of Israel, as these words were often spoken to them, Their redemption did not conclude with the ultimate physical conquest over all of their earthly enemies. But God's people, their saving grace or his redemption was rather extended to those who put their faith and trust in Jesus and who wait on him to return and make all things new. Wait on the Lord. Be strong and courageous. Wait on the Lord. You see, family, Jesus has already come and conquered all of sin and death. And thus, Christians have salvation and eternal victory secured in Christ Jesus because of the finished work on the cross where he died for the sins of men. And because our salvation and victory are found in God, we don't have to be afraid of anything. We don't have to be afraid of anything. As we go into this week, we don't have to be afraid of anything. We can replace fear with faith. And so today, we live in light of that victory. Christian brothers and sisters, we live in light of that victory. We as Christians are a victorious people because of Jesus, the beautiful name of Jesus. We are, of course, we're still in this world, and we will face struggles and difficulties, sadness and heartbreak, but we are victorious. Amen? And so as we live out our lives as salt and light in this world, We can wait on the Lord, just as David did, taking comfort, confidence, and courage in the truth of who God is and who we are as his beloved sons and daughters. I'm gonna call the band up as we begin to wrap things up. I've given us encouragement as Christians, but perhaps you're sitting here and maybe you're not a Christian, or perhaps you thought you were, but you realize that you've actually never personally transcended the truths about God and let them infiltrate your heart into a relationship with the living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You need to hear that Jesus has come to rescue his people and that God wants to enjoy fellowship and communion with you. If that's you here today, I'm pleading with you, imploring you, as David pleads with God for his presence, as we saw in Psalm 27 today, Come and put your faith and trust in Jesus and in what he did for you. He came to earth, was born of a virgin birth. He lived the perfect life, died the perfect death, conquered sin and death in rising from the grave. He ascended into heaven and is coming back one day soon to make all things new. Be strong and courageous as we wait in the Lord. We'd love to come alongside you. If that is you, we'd love to come alongside you, journey with you as you grow in your faith and trust in the Savior, Jesus Christ. But to those of us, if we have put our faith and trust in Jesus, what's our specific response to Psalm 27? Brothers and sisters, are our lives marked with fear of the world or confidence in God? Ask those around you. Are your lives marked with fear of the things of this world or confidence in God? When things get a little shaky, how do you respond? When things get drastically, drastically hard, how do you respond? Are our prayer and devotional lives marked with statements of who God is to us and assurances of who we are in God? Or are they more like to-do lists, petitions for God to sign off on? Do we take delight in knowing God just for knowing God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Do you long to gaze at his beautiful presence? Or do we have an end in mind whenever we come and seek to commune with God? Whenever we come to church, I'm gonna go to church, pray those prayers, and hopefully that'll get me uh, that promotion. 
Lord, have mercy on us. May we be a people like David who are so empowered by your spirit that we would be so confident and courageous that no matter what we face, it would be indeed be like attractive salt and light to a world so in desperate need of a savior that it would cause others to seek after Jesus, amen? If you're here today and you're praying that your heart and soul would thirst for God, just as David's did, I wanna encourage you to pray to God and ask that he would grow a deep hunger and thirst in you for more and more of him. Psalm 63 verse one is a beautiful prayer of David. It says, may we be a people who earnestly seek God, whose souls thirst for him, whose flesh faints for him, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Let's stand together and pray. Lord, as we've come to your word today, we've seen that no matter what this world seeks to tell us, there is actually only one thing that we need in this life. And we're pleading with you for it right now. It's you, your presence, Lord God. It's you. It's all about you, Jesus. Your presence, your life, you, O oh Lord. Holy Spirit, we ask that we don't merely just believe in you with our brains, but that in prayer and experience, Lord God, and in spirit and in truth, we would see and sense your beauty and perfection. Lord, would we love you for you and for you alone? Not as any means to an end, Lord God, even this morning, would you show us your beauty in our lives, Lord God. Show us your beauty in your, in your church, Lord God. Show us your beauty in this community, in our nation, Lord God, here on this earth. Show us your glory, Lord God. May we delight in it. Capture our hearts, O oh Lord. Capture our imaginations, our all, our everything. Would you do this, Lord God, so that we would find ultimate joy and pleasure in knowing and serving you. I pray, Lord God, for all of us, Lord God, as we, as we respond to this message. May we know you, Lord God. May we know your truth, but may those truths transcend our brains, Lord God, and move to our hearts that we would know who we are as children of God. Children who long to sit at the feet of their Father and enjoy his beautiful presence, Lord God. And as we do that, Lord God, would you stir up in us confidence to face whatever we are facing. Would you give us a hunger and a thirst to spend even more time with you, to focus more on you, Lord God, to draw our hearts, our minds, our everything to you, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, for those who need to come up here and just spend time at your feet and enjoy your beautiful presence. Holy Spirit, come and lead, come and lead. I pray for Lord, those, Lord God, who are searching for you. Would many come to know you, come to know you more. Thank you, Lord God, that in you we have salvation, secure. And so may we enjoy your presence as we will be, Lord God, forever and ever. In Jesus' name.